Hello and welcome to Nornet. Today we are joined by Konstantin Bark, the CEO of MPC Container Ships. My name is Roger Bernstein. Before we move on, it's important for you to know that this uh, session shall not be considered as investment advice. Our only goal is to learn more about MPC Container Ships as a company and its underlying industry. So, Konstantin, you will now take us through a presentation of MPC Container Ship, uh, the company you run. Thereafter, we will wrap things up with our Q&A session. Great. Many thanks uh, for having me, Roger. And I'm, I'm very pleased to present um, our company. And uh, on that note, I will just bring up the presentation here on the screen. OK, very good. All right. Um, I would very much like to use the uh, opportunity to run you through a, a quick intro to the company, then obviously look at the at the very dynamic container market today um, and, uh, and then also look forward for both the company and the market um, in, in what currently is a very exciting um, container market environment. So let me, let me start off with uh, company introduction and, and highlights. MPC Container Ships, we are the, the leading intra-regional tonnage provider. Um, we, we are the largest uh, tonnage provider globally with a focus on that very field. And we own 65 container vessels up to 3,500 uh, TU carrying capacity. Um, uh, today, we look at a fairly strong charter backlog, uh, whilst we're, we're at the same time still positioned to further benefit from the presently um, historically high charter market situation. Um, we have a clear focus on um, also transparency in terms of sustainability reporting. We issued our second ESG reporting earlier um, or late March this year, and we are committed to also achieving the um, ESG goals as set out by the IMO. Um, in terms of capital allocation, we take a very clear stance there. Um, uh, we're always focusing on optimizing shareholder value. Um, at the moment, um, we, we have a clear focus on delevering the company with the excess cash flow, but also obviously um, potential investments and returning capital to investors is uh, very much on the on the radar these days. On the right hand side here, you can see some of the uh, key figures. We just yesterday released our um, Q1 financials. We have seen a significant increase in charter earnings as a result of the improving market. Um, and we have also um, improved our EBITDA. So Q1 EBITDA of 22.3 million is actually uh, more than for the full year last year, which shows how um, uh, dynamic the market is at the very moment. And at 99%, we had a very strong um, utilization. In terms of company guidance, and I appreciate that in the Norwegian capital market, that is not too common. We have nevertheless, in order to guide the market, decided to um, provide a guidance for financial year 2021 to the market. And we have guided with revenues for the full year of 230 to 260 million and an expected EBITDA of 120 to 140. Um, I'll get to the charter backlog and visibility on earnings later on, but that just as a, as a short intro to the company um, at this point in time. Now let's look at the, um, at the exact position and the differences um, between tonnage provider and liner companies. I'm sure everyone uh, um, has uh, or is, is familiar with the container shipping space and its link to globalization in general. I just want to make that point that you know we, we are a tonnage provider. So if you look at this chart, um, you can see on the one hand, the tonnage provider scheme like ourselves, and on the other hand, the liner companies, our customers. So we charter out vessels for a fixed period um, on time charter basis um, on a mutually agreed charter party to liner companies and um, we are responsible for technical management um, so for the operating costs for the crewing and for insurance etc um, and in exchange we get a fixed uh, charter um, uh, hire on the other hand the liner companies operate the vessels they employ them in, in liner trades globally um, and they basically cover expenses such as the bunker so the fuel cost is basically on them um, and also port costs and, and, and other matters. In general, there's always a owned and chartered in mix of liner companies, roughly 50-50 historically, probably slightly more geared towards um, 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 kind of uh, tonnage providers or, or chartering in vessels. And at the bottom of this slide, you see the different sizes. So ranging from 100 TU carrying capacity up to the large vessels above 20,000 TU these days. And that has increased dramatically over the last 10 years in terms of sizes. So we 
our focus is in intra-regional trades. There, usually the vessels are somewhere between one and 5,000 TU. Actually, 98% of the vessels tr trading in, in intra-regional trades are in that size bracket. So that's a clear focus, and I'll elaborate on why we focus on that size in a minute. Looking at our fleet and some of the data points I already mentioned, our age profile is on average uh, 13 and a half years. Um, we, we have vessels ranging from one to three and a half thousand uh, TU, as you can see at the top right. Um, and, um, and at the bottom right, you can see that um, the difference between liner operators and tonnage providers, we are the largest tonnage provider with a very clear focus on intra-regional trades, meaning vessels up to 6,000 TU for, for that very, very purpose. Um, on the left-hand side, and, and I think that is worth noting because that's not known to non-industry insiders, is the fact that the intra-regional trades where we service in terms of number of ships is by far the largest uh, trade lane in that respect. And uh, you can see that there, roughly 54% of the vessels globally trade in intra-regional trades. And, 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 and therefore, um, it is basically the backbone of, um, 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 of the containerized uh, trade. And you see the three main trade areas, Latin America, Caribs, intra-Europe, and intra-Asia. In particular, intra-Asia is a fast-growing, very dynamic market where we see significant growth going forward. Um, and that's why we feel very comfortably positioned with, with our fleet and um, certainly the, the focus on those markets. Um, looking at how we, how we built the company over the last uh, couple of years, we had um, we started the company at a certain point on the cycle. On the left-hand side, you can see our build-up in terms of the funding side, equity, and uh, debt that, that we deployed in order to acquire ships at what we felt was a very attractive time in the cycle. And we'll get to that in a minute. And on the right-hand side, you can see how we moved up from back then NOTC over Euronext growth, back then uh, named differently, uh, Euro Euronext expand into the main board of the Oslo Börsch. We are, in fact, one of a very few companies, I think only two in the last decade, who have received a certain exemption or, or, or credit from the Oslo Börsch to actually uplist into the main board, um, uh, despite uh, we were not, uh, we did not have three years of trading history because of our uh, position. Um, in addition, um, on the right hand side, you see the market um, uh, momentum when we entered the market. Um, so in light gray, this is when we entered the market, we felt that there was a supply demand rebalancing taking place in the course of the next three to five years. We are now in a situation where this certainly has materialized and we are very excited about the current market timing. Um, having said that, um, if you look at the uh, red line, which shows the second-hand price for 2,800 TU container ship, basically the sweet spot of our fleet, um, and the blue lane shows the uh, time charter development, and you can see that asset values lag behind charter rates. Currently, um, a 2,800 TU ship earns around $28,000, whilst the asset values for a 15-year-old ship are around 18 and a half million, according to this Clarkson's index. Worth noting that the last time we have seen similarly high rates, um, the asset prices were double. So I certainly expect that asset prices will follow chart rates in the foreseeable future, and we will see a steep increase in asset values in the month ahead. Now, moving on to the market, um, just quickly he here is a, at the top, uh, you see the, 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 let's say, key, indicators both for the freight market, meaning the box market, so liner operators, meaning freight rates and annual TEU throughput, so volumes that get transported on, um, on this globe. Um, as you can see, the annual TEU throughput um, over the last, uh, more than the last decade has, has always increased with the exception of last year where we've seen a small drop um, and is on, 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 on all time high basically as a result of the continuously increasing demand and increasing volumes. At the same time, the um, freight rates have uh, skyrocketed basically as of uh, the latter half of uh, 2020 and are currently at a very high level, meaning our customers, the line operators, earn a lot of money at the moment, which is obviously a very good constellation looking at, at our very selves. And on the top right, um, uh, you see the relevant indicators for charter owners like ourselves, uh, meaning where is the charter market, which is the red line, the charter rate index uh, here in case of Harpex is at an all-time high. 
close to an all-time high at least. Uh, and the idle vessels, so unutilized fleet, is at a, close to an all-time low with only 56 vessels sitting idle at the moment. So both ingredients, very important factors. Um, and the outlook, I'll, I'll run through that um, in a second. At the bottom, you see the respective details for 15-year-old second-hand prices and, and um, S&P activity. Um, bottom left, you see the, the, the light blue columns. Um, um, there is quite an increase in activity and the rates, uh, sorry, the prices have increased significantly. At the same time, if you look at time charter rates on the right-hand side, you see they followed the same trajectory. So, so very much a increasing market. And I think the most important thing is what I will explain on the next slide. And that is, we're not talking about very high rates and increasing secondhand values. We're also talking about that you are able to lock in these rates for a prolonged time. And that differentiates the container market at the moment very much from other sectors, where we have also seen an increase in activity, especially in the dry book space, but you will not be able to lock in the rates there for three years, which is the case in the container market. That in turn means the values are supported by contracts, are supported by fixed cash flows, and therefore should be more stable going forward, providing a significant um, 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 upside, but at the same time also significant protection. Now looking at the prolonged periods, and that is what I alluded to just now, um, we have a situation where um, on the top left, you see the right li line, which is the period business, meaning for how long is a vessel being chartered out? And that has skyrocketed since um, the latter part of last year. And we're now looking between one and 5,000 TU intra region vessels, our trades. You look at a, a average period of basically two years, which means in turn, and that's the positive on the top right, you can see that illustrated that we are looking at basically a drying out of vessel availability going forward because every vessel that is fixed now will disappear from the charter market for at least the next two years, looking at the um, periods that are being covered at the very moment. So I think this is a very positive trend. Uh, this is very interesting as well, because it also shows there is a sustainability going forward in terms of the charter market, simply because of much lower availability of charter vessels to the market, given their long-term na the long nature of these contracts. And that in my book is a very attractive um, part of the analysis. Then to wrap up this picture um, at the bottom left, and I know it's a lot of dots uh, and, and um, maybe a graph that is not uh, immediately digestible, um, I would like to explain a bit on, on this one because it basically so shows the correlation between charter rates and asset prices. Um, on the x-axis, you see charter rates on the example of a 2,800 TU container ship again. And on the other axis, you can see the secondhand asset values. Um, so what we have looked at is where actually is the link between charter rates and asset values and where do we, where are we in, in the historical context? And it is clearly shown that whilst you know, asset prices have stepped up and charter rates, as I explained, or charter periods have gotten longer, there is, they are lagging behind. And, and also in historical context, so based on the cash flow projection and the ability to realize cash flow by logging in charters, in my book, there's only a clear way north for asset values in the foreseeable future, um, unless anything changes but we'll get to the more midterm outlook on market in a second. So there is significant upside still in asset values. And that is what we deem as very attractive to give you an example, you can now lock in a, a 2,500 TU container ships for three years at, at a charter rate of 27,000 uh, US dollars per day. That translates into an EBITDA of around 20 to 22 million, um, plus the steel value of the ship, which is another four and a half. You would be looking at a value, and that's, that's a secured cash flow value of 26 million for such a vessel. Again, if that compares to the chart I show, I've shown earlier of secondhand values trading more 18 to 20, there is a significant upside in this valuation alone. Now, let me uh, look forward on, let's say, a bit of a midterm perspective. What is actually the market saying uh, going forward? Uh, and shipping is all about demand and supply. Um, on the 
top left, you can see the supply demand development for the overall market, the blue line being the supply growth, uh, a reflection of new deliveries um, to the market, meaning the order book translating into deliveries, um, uh, minus scrapping. We don't expect any significant scrapping given the state of the market at this stage. Um, and the red line shows the demand uh, development. And as you can see in 2020, we have seen quite a dip in demand. So a negative growth in container shipping in history, there were only two instances where the market didn't grow. And that was 2009 post Lehman and 2020 due to the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Um, it is worth noting, however, that the dip in demand was only generated in the period between February and May when we saw lockdowns globally. After that, the market picked up significantly. So um, uh, this negative impact is basically a result of the lockdown. And the second half of the, of the year was already very, very good and continues at very strong pace. Um, and on that basis, the demand growth that is expected is around 6 to 7% for this year and around 6% for next year versus uh, only moderate supply growth. Now, what does that do with our very fleet. We have on the right-hand side also shown the more intra-regional perspective, um, meaning vessels in our size up to 5,000 TU. And there you can see due to the you know, composition of the order book, um, there is a very slim order book in that, that size. At the same time, the demand prospects are even more favorable in, 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 that, um, in that field because we, we have certain trends like, um, uh, you know, Southeast Asia growing significantly nearshoring, but also to some extent, people want to make their supply chains more resilient. And, and hence we have seen additional ton mile demand on the waters. And we believe there's a, a very good case that the demand growth in intra-regional trades will actually outperform the overall market. So that means the picture in the overall market is good and in the intra-regional market, it is even better. And that is the market where we are positioned. Now to wrap up kind of my presentation with, um, um, with a quick um, company outlook, um, again, a lot of numbers, but I think the headlines are important. We have a much increased kind of charter backlog and visibility. As it stands today, we have a charter backlog of around US dollar 400 million in charter revenues locked in. Um, and that is distributed over 2021, 2022, 2023. Um, on the top left, you can see the fixed operating days. So what days available or which of the available days of our fleet is already covered? Um, and you can see that, you know, we, we are 13% open for this year. So we have 87% coverage. And that with that 80% coverage for this year, we have already locked in 223 million US dollars in charter revenue. For the next year, we have roughly 140 million US dollars and 41% of the days already locked in and that will continue going forward. And you can find the respective figures here on this slide uh, on the top right. Um, in addition, um, bottom left, the longer the periods, the more important the counterparties are. Um, our counterparties are a reflection basically of the very large liner companies and intra-regional carriers with Maersk and Costco being the biggest customers of ourselves. Um, and I think this is a very good reflection. And as I said earlier, also our customers earn very good money in this very market environment. Now, besides the kind of locked in revenue, I think it is important to also look at what lies ahead. And uh, that is illustrated at the bottom left where we have shown um, Q1 and Q2 basically to date fixtures that have already been concluded um, in dark and uh, light gray, differentiating between vessels below 2000 and above 2000 to you um, and what still lays ahead of us. And I think that is a good mix of having locked in a significant cash flow with the 400 million that I mentioned, and at the same time have good market exposure to continue to benefit from ever and ever strengthening charter rates as we have seen at the moment. So that is that gives you an idea of the exposure and of how we will lock in the cash flow going forward. What does that do to our business? Um, and that is shown on the on the next slide where we basically um, look at uh, the cash break even per vessel and day. Um, and the bridge starts here from left to right and the, the red column some, somewhat in the middle of this graph shows the 7,900 US dollars per day and vessel cash break even, including capex and interest and, and the amortization. Um, and at the same time, we compare that on the right-hand side with the Clarkson spot rates for our very 
vessel basket. So we have looked at our vessel sizes and types and, 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 and the, the, the clocks and spot rates. So that's roughly $25,000. So on an annualized basis, that translates into a significant um, cash flow generation or EBITDA generation, of course. Um, and that is the market in which we are currently de- um, uh, chartering out new vessels at very attractive prices. Of course, there is already a charter backlog, so, so this will not apply to each and every vessel in the fleet. But to the, the upcoming charter renewals, in our view, uh, in absence of any negative market development, will be fixed on, on those price levels. And as a comparison on the right-hand side, you can see the 20 average for our fleet, still well above uh, the total cash break given. So we are very positive about the market going forward. Just to wrap up the presentation and then jump into uh, a quick Q&A, let me just give you the highlights and why we think we are very well positioned in today's market and also going forward. Let's start from left to right from market over our very position and the outlook. The short-term market fundamentals have, have, are basically historically good. Uh, we have locked in a lot and we will continue to lock in more charters in this exciting market environment. Um, and we are very well positioned to participate in the continuous upswing, uh, which is, uh, in our view, a very attractive position to be in. Secondly, if you look at the midterm, I explained the dynamics in terms of supply and demand, the high visibility that the supply will not change because the order book for the next two to three years is basically carved in stone. If you want to order a vessel now, it will not come. Uh, you will not be able to get it until 2023, the earliest, more 2024. So there's a, a very attractive supply and demand development when you look at the global market, but in particular, the intra-regional segment. And lastly, and I think this is a bit of a obviously long-term view, but the industry landscape will be affected by the general scheme of energy transition, the general scheme of decarbonization. And we want to take an active role there um, as an industry participant, but also as the industry in general. Um, if you look at our very fleet and our position in that, in that field, we feel very well positioned looking at the age profile of our vessels. We have on average 13 and a half year old ships. We believe it will take a while until the, the new fuels and new systems and new vessels are actually available to the market. Um, and that will take at least another five to 10 years. So in our view, it's good to have kind of our fleet profile in this market to continue to benefit from a strong market, but at the same time, um, also invest in our vessels and technologies going forward to be ready when there is an opening for a new technology in, in, in terms of new propulsion, new fuels, etc. So looking at the um, fairly low financial leverage of our company and the significant operational leverage, as I said, every you know charter that we fix is, is well above our cash rack even, we have a very strong cash generation and we even have a higher cash generation capacity going forward. So we consider this uh, company and the MPCC as a, as a low residual value risk uh, shipping uh, company with very high cash generation capacity, which is also comparing us to all the peers, I think a very attractive proposition. And now looking forward, what is on the agenda? On the agenda is to optimize our balance sheet, uh, delever somewhat financially, take sound capital allocation decisions. There are certainly a lot of opportunities that will come up um, and obviously to also return capital to investors over time. Um, we believe with our cash flow um, backlog, we have a very resilient position, even in varying long-term market env- environments. And we are, as I mentioned, well positioned for the energy transition. And on that note, I would like to jump into the discussion, uh, Roger, and many thanks for, for the interest. First of all, I, I would uh, like you to comment something about 2020. It was a hectic, hectic year for you and for, for uh, most, most of the industries out there. The underlying market for you was difficult going into 2020. Uh, and then the COVID-19 struck. So from a CEO's perspective, what went through your mind when the pandemic uh, made the world shut down? Um, so can, you, can you give us uh, some, some extra comments on that? 
Yes, absolutely. And, and indeed, it has been. And, and I always refer to it as a bit of a roller coaster experience. Uh, I think most of us have been to a roller coaster. So sometimes it feels good, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so it, it was clearly a, a up and down in the market. Going into 2020, actually, the year was supposed to be a fairly solid growth year for container shipping. And then with the pandemic and the lockdowns, and I think the complete absence of visibility, that was the biggest issue, right? Because we, we had a lot of vessels being, uh, being on short-term contracts because no one saw what, what was coming. Uh, people just re-delivered um, um, our vessels to ours, ourselves. So, so we pretty much lost the um, visibility on what tomorrow would bring in terms of, um, you know, will we be re-delivered, will we not? And that, uh, that caused us to take certain uh, measures to, to protect uh, the company in the best interest of all stakeholders. Um, so that was really a tough experience between I would say March and, and, and May, June, July in particular. Having said that, what, what then came was also unclear. Um, so, but um, I'm sure we'll touch on that as well. But it was really the absence of visibility um, that was challenging. Um, but I think in, in hindsight, all stakeholders supported the company. Uh, the shareholders were, were very strong supporters, um, but also the creditors. So I think we all... Uh, took the right measures and decisions to stabilize the company for what is now a very good market. Yeah, you're, you're correct. The second half, everything changed. Um, so the, the container shipping rates, they reached their highest levels in, I don't know, 10 years or so. What, what happened? Uh, did, did you see the turnaround coming? Uh, or if so, uh, when? Well, I think uh, the answer is no, um, not, not in the steepness of the recovery, right? I mean, um, I, I think we neither saw the steepness of the decline coming nor the steepness of the recovery. And if you look at the various market participants, also the liner companies, no one saw it coming right? Because certain actions was, would have been taken differently. Um, so it, it caught everyone by surprise. What, however, we did do is we tried even in the very low market to stay low, short with the contracts because we knew the market would come at some point in time. What I would though say is when we started MPC container ships in 2017, we, the, 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 the main strategic consideration was a supply demand rebalancing. Uh, and that is what we see at the very moment. So we didn't see coming what, what, what came second half of last year, but what we had expected. And if you look back at our kind of company presentation from 2017, you will see that we said it's a three to five year recovery story in our view um, with rebalancing of the market. Now, 2019 and 2020 was way more challenging than we had expected with, you know, uh, the pandemic and before the trade war, you know, all of that had effects on, on the demand side. Um, but uh, that the market would recover was, was always our firm belief. Um, the strength and the steepness of the recovery was a surprise. But the idea was always to then be able to lock in charters for longer periods at higher rates. And this is the market in which we are at, at, at present. Um, and, and the sudden change in market condition, that's, that's obvious, uh, 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 something you are familiar with. Uh, for every every shipping company, there's that the cyclicality is uh, is huge. But th this was extreme. The pandemic was extreme. Um, so let's move on to the to the Q numbers from the first first quarter. They mm -hmm. were they were strong, so solid numbers. But are you satisfied? That's my uh, my question. In hindsight. Uh, could you have done better? Well, I, I, yes, we are satisfied. It, it however, is only the beginning um, because we are, we are obviously, and, and I think that's important to note, um, uh, that we are still digesting charters that, that have been, you know, concluded uh, last year, right? So, so every quarter we roll over more charters, let's say, in the new higher environment. So, so what, what, what we have been doing is to, to consider the periods um, of, of charter contracts in, in this market and at those rates, as I mentioned earlier, you know, very high rates, long periods, it creates immediately value for our um, company and for our shareholders. So the next quarters will, uh, will definitely be better. And that's also a reflection in our guidance, right? Our guidance is 120 to 140 in EBITDA million. And in Q1, we only did 22. So 
So it's, it's, it's by virtue of the charter book and the charters that we have concluded and are now rolling over that um, the next quarters will be better. So, so I think this is, this is important um, to note. But other than that, we are happy. We're extremely satisfied with the high utilization, which is not just the chartering, but also the technical side of things. So we have a very high utilization of the fleet. We, the vessels are in good condition. Um, so, so I think that there we are, better, uh, there, there we are very comfortable and, and doing better is something for the next quarters. So can, can you give us some, some details around your strategy when it comes to fixing uh, long-term charter rates? Uh, so my, my question is, do you have a rule book way of doing business or uh, are you willing to speculate uh, from time to time or, uh, also? Well, I think we, uh, in this market environment, our rule book is to, to, to lock in the cash flows because you're, you're, simply, you're simply able to harvest so much. Um, and, and I give you a few examples. I mean, some of the 2,800 TU container ships we, we bought for, for eight to nine million uh, dollars um, a few years back. And if we fix them now out on a three-year contract, we're able to secure 20 million plus in EBITDA and the steel value of the ship is, is another four and a half, as I mentioned during my presentation earlier. And that, that puts a kind of value and acquisition price in context. And we believe the ability to harvest through logging in long-term cash flows in today's market is the way to go. Um, we believe, and, and, and you can lock in two to three year contracts for our vessels at the moment, um, trending north uh, also in terms of period. So, so that's, I think that's, that's kind of our rule book. In addition, and I think that's important, especially when you look at this year, we have a bit of a staggered charter book, charter exposure anyways, because of the fact that we have a, um, a certain dry docking windows, right? So, so we have this year, comparably high number of dockings just by virtue of the vessel size, uh, vessel age. So every five years you need to bring the ship through dry dock. So we have 18 dockings this year. So that's a comparably high number. So through that, we have a good staggered book and that makes us also benefit from, uh, you know, the, the next quarters in terms of uh, charter renewal. So, so this is in today's market, the rule book says, go long if you can create value. Um, and I think going long is what, what we can create a lot of value for our shareholders at the moment. So I, I'd like also to touch up on the market dynamics. Uh, it's now that the profitability is yeah, very good uh, and outlook is good as well. Um, there might be some bumps in, in the road ahead. But my question is, because of the profitability uh, in the industry right now, is it natural to think, assume that the supply of ships will increase in the years to come? You said in your presentation that your new, new ships will maybe come in 2023 20, or 24, the earliest. Can, can you, uh, what signs are there out there uh, that the ship owners, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and for you, you as well, you, you, are, are you thinking of uh, renewing your fleet, uh, using your cash? You, you have a balance sheet and you, 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 can, you, you can use it and for your advantage. What, can, can you give us some, some flavor, some comments uh, in, in that perspective? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the situation is such that... Um, there will be new supply. Actually, new supply of vessels is needed, is desperately needed. I mean, there, there have been quite a bit of new orders placed over the last six to eight months, um, mainly in the larger sizes. Um, if you were to go out to order a ship now, um, you, will, uh, you will not get, get it delivered early as 2023, uh, rather 2024. So the window of slots available for those deliveries is closing very fast now. Um, if you then look at... Um, the age profile of, of, of the vessels, it becomes very clear and apparent that you need new ships. So I'm not that concerned about uh, new orders um, because it's, it's actually needed. Um, I mean, if you look at, um, uh, if you combine that with the yard capacity and ability to deliver ships, I mean, in our segment, 40% of the vessels are above 15 years of age. So with our 13 and a half, we're still 
younger than 40% of the fleet uh, globally in, in, in our bracket. So 40% in, in our size is, is, is more than uh, 1,000 vessels. And, and those vessels will have to be renewed in the course of the next five to 10 years anyway. In addition, we will have and we should strive for uh, kind of, uh, you know, improve the carbon footprint of uh, the commercial fleet globally. So naturally, there are uh, th there is a requirement to renew the fleet. There's a requirement to bring that down, um, uh, either by regulation, but also in inherently. I mean, we we have kind of committed to to reducing emissions on on our fleet as well. We will carry out a few measures there, um, but we believe also to operate vessels for their whole lifetime life cycle approach uh, is is very important. So, in terms of new orders, it's 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 obviously we we know what's out there. We we're looking at it. We believe for the time being there's still a lot of uncertainties about the right propulsion, especially about the supply of the right uh, fuels, um, um, and that's even more relevant for smaller vessels because you, you operate them globally in different trades. You know, if you have a, a, a large vessel, a 20,000 U that goes east-west from China to, uh, to, to Rotterdam, for example, they can fuel LNG or something else. But on smaller vessels, this is really the trading pattern is much more uh, complex. So taking a decision there is even more uh, challenging. I see. Could you... Um... Since we speaking of emissions and, and future regulations, there, there are some uh, I, IMO regulations uh, coming up, um, which will affect every shipping company around the world. Can can you give us what will happen uh, for 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 the, the older ships? Do they have to to uh, to travel uh, at a slower speed? And, and uh, what, what's your take on that? And, and, and what, what will that uh, mean for, for, uh, for you? I mean, yes, one consequence is certainly uh, that vessels will go on, on, on basically will slow steam. So we'll go on, on um, lower um, speeds. Um, that in turn will actually be positive to the market because it will you know, reduce the, the capacity available. Um, so, so there's actually a very positive um, effect of that. Um, that applies to, to, to most of the vessels. I mean, some vessels don't go at high speeds, right? For example, on our vessels, 60% would, would not go at, at, at high speeds, right? Um, but it all depends on the trade where they're employed. Recently, due to the um, uh, complex uh, kind of situation in the markets in terms of the Suez Canal blockage, but also the container box shortages. Um, all these elements vessels went slightly faster again. Um, but in our trades, uh, they, they don't go. I mean, our ships can go up to 21, uh, 22 knots, and they're currently they, they, where they're employed in trades where they sometimes only go 13, 14 knots. So, so there's already quite a, um, a, a slow speed on some of our vessels. So they will not be that much affected by this change. Mm -hmm. um, but globally, it will have an effect. And that effect will mean more capacity is, is bound. Um, and that, in turn, will be very positive to the market. Uh, I have to add uh, a question. In, in, in your view, if, if, the, if, the, uh, if, the, if the balance... If, if the, the, the rates are, are going even higher in the coming months or years, um, can it can it uh, can it break down or something? Can, can it can it damage can it damage uh, the world economy because the transportation sector is it's essential uh, for everybody? Do, do can can you comment on that? Yeah, I think it's it's worth noting that you know today we have a market environment where liner companies and vessel owners um, make good money, right? Um, as we as we have explained in our case, but also applicable for the liner companies. Um, if you look back the last ten years, um, the profitability was not that great in uh, for for liners and for owners. However, um, and that's the difference in container shipping, which is for me more logistics. It's it's different uh, than dry bulk or tankers, um, right? Um, you have more intermediaries in in in, in container shipping, um, and 
the shippers, so Kuno Nagel, the, the, you know, and, and other freight forwarders, they have earned a fortune over the last 10 years. So, so it's just a bit of a reshifting of who bears what costs and who is how profitable. Um, now, you know, people who, who sit on the real assets, um, like the liner companies and ourselves, are benefiting from this shift because it's a, um, let's say, um, um, it's a tighter demand and supply situation. And so we're, we're just transferring some of the profitability from the shippers and the freight forwarders to the liners and, and the owners. And I think this is, this is not necessarily changing the whole picture. Um, it's just also a bit of transfer of profit margin. Um, and, and I think this is actually not a negative trend at all. Um, so I think it's just, you know, if you look at the, the whole industry, People always made money. And yes, at the moment, it's, it's this extraordinary disruption due to firstly COVID and then the catch up effects and, 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 and you don't have the boxes where you need them. So it, it, quite a bit of disruption um, and the Suez Canal blockage, which I think we all witnessed um, um, a few weeks back has added to that complexity um, because you had more delays, et cetera. But uh, this, will, this will normalize. Um, it will probably not normalize until early next year, um, but but then still the capacity um, and supply demand dynamics uh, fundamentally don't change over the next uh, one to two years because of the order book, as I'm as I've explained. Interesting. Uh, can we touch upon risk factors? Uh, sure. It's important for investors to know about the specific risk factors associated with, with the company and, and the industry as a whole. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the different risk factors out there for you? Is it, is it when it comes to personal, financial, security, nature of the industry, regulations, and last but not least, geopolitics. Uh, we have China and the US, they are competing and expected to compete uh, a bit tougher uh, upon each other in the com in coming years. Yeah, and I think you touched on on a few. I mean, in the end, to 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 look at what what are the risk. I mean, there are there are risk related to operating the the ships, um, and those are, um, for example, um, I mean, at the moment we have, for example, quite a, cu a crew crisis because you know, uh, crew crews on board of ships, in my view, are very key, are key personnel globally because they make the world go in the end, right? So. Um, so all the COVID implications that that has on on this is is, is a key issue. So far, um, we have uh, been able to to weather that challenge uh, quite quite good, like like other shipping companies as well, thanks to the um, seagoing personnel and their and their effort and, and engagement. Um, so th so this is this is a risk related to to the operation of the ship. I think there we are well prepared, but this is a a operational risk that is out there. Looking at it a bit more macro. Shipping is all about demand and supply, um, and and so so factors that affect demand or that affect supply. So we touched on some of the supply elements earlier. Will there be a ordering spree? There, my answer is there has to be an ordering spree because we need to renew the fleet anyway. Um, so so that but but that has been in the past a risk that that that, that becomes in disbalance because of uh, too many orders. So this risk is out there. I think for the foreseeable future, it is kind of. Uh, I'm, I'm more positive about it because firstly, you need ships. Secondly, if you order a ship now, it will not come until 2024. And thirdly, the propulsion question and technology question remains unanswered for the time being. So I think therefore on the supply side, I'm, there is a risk, but I'm positive. If you then look at the demand side, and there are some of the elements that you had mentioned come into play, geopolitical um, risks, I mean, the pandemic, um, lockdowns, I mean, if, if things like that happen, disruption on the, on the demand side. And we have seen this in 2019 with trade war escalations. And it was less the, the, the impact that really had on, uh, on trading of goods because that was still okay. It was the psychological impact, Im impact, right? And the unwillingness to take risk and to invest into certain areas on this globe that made people be a bit more um, let's say defensive in their decisions to go into commitments, also on the shipping side, obviously. So, so, so those those are elements. And then geopolitically, yes, of course. I mean, if we 
Um, if we have, uh, you know, just look at at, at, uh, at the situation in, in, in Israel uh, with the Hamas just, just recently, I mean, all of these can happen and might have an effect on, on the way the world goes. Um, but um, um, at least, you know, going forward and then back to my point earlier, the only two years where we saw a decline in demand was 20, 2009 and 2020. So, um, it has to be extraordinary events, um, and that you, those you cannot rule out. But if you want to plan with these events as part of your business case, um, also as an investor, then you shouldn't invest in anything, right? So, so I think it's just a, a nature of the beast, so to say, um, and of the world we live in. Uh, good. Uh, I have one final section. Uh, some concluding remarks. Do you have some concluding remarks? Uh, and there's that, that two remarks I like to 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 to, uh, to make. Uh, that's about how confident are you going forward. That's just sum, summing everything up. And uh, and I also want to know what will be your top priorities uh, in the near future. Sure. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the way forward, and, and I hope that came across, I'm, 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 I'm pretty excited, I must say. So I'm, I'm excited about the market dynamics. I'm excited about the fact that we see good charter rates, that we see long periods. So, so we, we will build up a, a, a constant charter backlog. And, and that puts us in a position to to really generate a lot of cash. And, and that again is good because we can return capital to investor, we can de-risk the company by delevering, and we can follow and pursue interesting opportunities that will inevitably come in my in my book. So so on the back of that, um, and especially looking at the demand supply dynamics, I'm I'm pretty excited about not just 2021, but but even more so uh, 2022 and beyond. So, so I think for the next, let's say, two to five years, we are we are very positive about the market. Having said that, obviously the the whole energy transition, etc., as I mentioned in in my concluding slide during the presentation, this this will shape and affect the industry. But I think to have a low risk um, company with good cash generation is the best um, basis to actually enter that, uh, um, enter into that, uh, into that phase. And um, and maybe to your to your latter point in terms of priorities, our key priority is to to kind of reshape the balance sheet a bit. I mean, we have a few invest uh, or, or financing silos that we can, in my view, improve and optimize to gain more flexibility maybe bring down also the cost of, 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 of our debt, which is already quite competitive, I would say, but uh, there's always room for improvement. And then obviously also to carry out certain investments in our vessels in order to um, uh, to reduce emissions. I mean, this is also a very important aspect. We have also responsibility for the world we live in, um, and that is, that is a very important aspect um, um, as well. But um, as I said, excited about the, the way forward, excited about 2021 and, and, and beyond. And I think towards the latter half of this year, we will also have much more visibility as a company for 2022 and 2023. And I think that is um, uh, something to, uh, to continue to, to monitor. Very good, Constantine. I, I, think, I, I think we will stop right there. Mm -hmm. And I, I will thank you uh, both for your time and, and your, uh, especially your insights. Um, we will keep in touch. I will invite you later this year. Hopefully you can give us an update, uh, uh, a new update then. Uh, and to everybody who uh, tuned in, uh, goodbye. <laughs>